Matthew 16, verse 21 says, From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and he said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever desires to lose his life for my sake will find it. For what, will, what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and yet he loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Speak to our hearts today, I pray. Lord, fill this room with your conviction power and bring us back to the place we need to be. Father, we ask you in the mighty name of Jesus to rearrange our lives today. Help us get our priorities intact and help us, Lord, to be able to live for you as best as we possibly can. We believe you're coming soon. People need to be ready. Thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, turn to somebody one more time and tell them good morning. Praise the Lord. We're excited that you're here. Come on. Let me, I'm going to ask you one more time because I'm pumped up today. It's exciting. How many of you are glad to be here? Amen. All right. You sound a little bit more awake today. I'm, I'm glad that you're here today. And so I'm going to ask you right now at the very beginning of this message to forgive me in advance. Because today we're going to deal with some hard stuff. But you know what? I'm going to tell you something. Whenever we deal with God's truth, it's transformational. It literally changes our lives. And the Word of God is a two-edged sword. Amen? What does that mean? It, it, it cuts and divides. But you know, a good surgeon's scalpel doesn't just cut. It also helps to bring healing. And so today, we're going to look at the Word of God. I'm starting a brand new series today entitled, Killing Sacred Cows. I need everybody to do something for me. I need you to, with the biggest Northwest Oklahoma fervor you can do right now, I just need you to moo like a cow. Can you do that? Come on, moo. I need to hear you. I need to hear you. There are a couple times in this message today, I may point like this, and you know what that means. It means what? All right. I got you. We're going to work together today. But today we're going to talk about killing sacred cows. Over the next few weeks, I know you're going to be challenged. You're going to be inspired. You're going to be awakened to truth as we look at some really delicate issues, I believe. And so we have to look at, first of all, what is a sacred cow? Well, that, that term, sacred cow, is actually one that was coined in India through the religion of Hinduism. I don't know if you've ever studied comparative religions and what other people believe, but in Hinduism, their cows are not like here in northwest Oklahoma. We like to eat them. Amen. They're a little bit different. They are raised almost like a pet in a house, very close to the family and different things like that. And there's a sect of Hinduism that believes in re reincarnation. Matter of fact, they believe that cows are one of the most holy, sacred animals. And they actually believe that when a person dies, one of the gods makes them come back as a, all right, a cow. Now, I'm not saying that to make fun of Hindus. I've known several, and I've, I know one um, that actually gave their life to Christ. But, but that's the truth about Hinduism. And so, you don't eat the cow because it might be grandma. Amen. It may be somebody's next life. And so, the thing is, the cows are sacred. So, you don't touch the sacred cows. Well, the truth is, while we don't have sacred cows that actually go moo, uh, sacred cow, the, the terminology has been coined to actually be considered as thoughts, ideas, or doctrines, or things that we have uttered to be truth, or we've uttered them to be holy or scriptural, yet they have no bearing in the gospel. And so today we're going to look at some things that I think all of us need to come into alignment with to see exactly what it is that God is trying to say to us through our text. See, last week was Easter, 
and we talked about the cross in which Jesus died upon. But that is only but one cross that is mentioned in the New Testament. Not only does the New Testament mention the cross that Jesus died upon, but yet the Bible also mentions the cross, are you ready for this? That you and I are to die upon. And so today we're going to look at what the Bible talks about as far as being a disciple of Jesus Christ. What does it actually mean to follow Jesus. And so if you'll bear with me, we're going to look in the scripture and see exactly what it is because I'm going to kick over the sacred cow today that basically says just because somebody repeats a prayer only that everything in their life from that point forward is all right with God. And I'm going to show you what Jesus teaches us legitimately about following him in fact the concept of just simply uttering something and being okay is not found in the bible at all i'm going to give you something about this found in the in the book of james james chapter 2 verse 14 turn over there with me if not it's on the screen james chapter 2 verse 14 through 19 reads like this james writes he says what does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but yet he has no works can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm and filled, do you not give them the things which are needed for the body? What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But somebody will say, You have faith. And another will say, I have works. So show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe, notice this, you believe that there is one God. You do well, even the demons believe and tremble. You see, there are a lot of people, leave that verse up right there, there are a lot of people who think they're right with God just simply because they prayed a fast prayer behind a preacher one time, and they believe in God, that all of a sudden, they are saved without question. And we're going to get into this and bring a balance to this in a moment, but I believe this type of thinking has led to the downfall of westernized church and Christianity where we have people who are not willing to run with and to suffer with the gospel when Jesus requires us to. Notice what the Bible says right here. Even the demons believe and tremble. The scripture is recorded with times where Jesus would go into a synagogue and the very first instance we see of Jesus doing that encounters a demonic man who is in the synagogue and the, the, the demon-possessed man acknowledges Christ and says, Son of David, why have you come to torment us before the time? Even demons believe in Jesus. That's why sometimes people are like, oh, it's, it's, I'm spiritual. You know, you got to clarify these days. Because even demons are spiritual. Amen? The Bible says that believe not every spirit, but try every spirit to see if it's of the Lord. So we have to understand that even demons believe and tremble. Demons are smart enough. Scripture is filled with instances where they would run and throw themselves down. Even the man of Gadara, who was filled with legions of demons, the Bible says he threw himself down and he worshipped Jesus. Isn't it interesting? Demons have sometimes more sense than people do. But the demon came down and worshipped the Lord and begged for mercy. So we're going to look at this in a moment and exactly see what does it mean to believe on the Lord? What does it mean to follow Him in salvation? Now, there seems to be a conflict in Scripture, but there really isn't. Now, I can just hear right now somebody asking in their heart, Pastor, what about those verses that talk about, you know, uh, such as Acts chapter 2, verse 21. What about the scripture who says, Who all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? I believe that scripture. Well, what about the scripture in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that says this, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe on your heart, then you shall be saved. What about those scriptures, such as Acts 2 and Romans 10? Because they tend to put an emphasis on saying something. And a lot of times people approach a relationship with God and we just feel like, man, if I can just get people to repeat this, then everything's okay. 
But I want to emphasize two things in those scriptures, Acts 2 and Romans 10, that's going to bring a balance to all of this, and I think it'll help you. Go back to Acts 2, verse 21 with me. Notice what it says. And all who call on the name of the, say it with me, Lord. All who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now look at Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Look at this with me and see what it says. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says that it will, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Notice Acts chapter 2 and Romans verse 10 both emphasize the word Lord. The word Lord is very significant in Scripture because it is repeated not just one time, not just two times, but hundreds, literally, of times. And the word Lord in Scripture, in the Greek New Testament, here's what it literally means. It means master, as one who owns a slave. Now, I want you to think about something. That gives a whole new connotation when we use the word Lord as referring to Jesus. When we say, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life, that means something. It, it, it means now that the ownership of my life, the title deed of my life at Calvary was transferred over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ to the point Paul taught that when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just die alone, we were crucified with Christ. Paul lived a crucified life. But yet so many people say, well, Jesus is my Lord. But they don't look like Jesus. They don't walk like Jesus. They don't talk like Jesus. But yet somebody in their life said, baby, if you just say this really fast, you don't even really have to mean it, just say it real fast, then everything is good in your life. But I want to tell you what Jesus had to say about this philosophy. Luke chapter 6, verse 46, this is one of the most startling scriptures in the ministry of Jesus. Notice what he said. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Why do you call me Lord, and yet you don't obey me? Jesus is looking at people who have a a, a head knowledge, if you will, and they have a vocal commitment to him. Their mouth is moving, but their legs are not following. And Jesus is saying, why is it then that you call me Lord and you don't do the things which I say? Then you butt that up to one of the most scary passages that I've preached on several times. It's Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus says these words on the day of judgment. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Notice this. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So now we have a conundrum. We have people who preach a grace, 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 and grace alone, which Paul did say in the book of Ephesians, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. It, it, absolutely true. One cannot buy or earn or work their way into salvation. I wholeheartedly agree with that. There's not one thing that happened upon Mount Calvary that I can pay for. Jesus covered all of that. But the Bible does teach that there was an exchange. I laid down my life for his life. It is a crucified life. Now what we see is James, who is counter seem to be contradicting Paul when he's really not. And here's what James says. Faith without works is dead. In other words, a conversion experience. With Je the word conversion literally means to be transformed, to be changed, to be totally different. So here's what James is saying. A faith that is only a vocal faith with no transformation is nothing greater than a demonic faith. For even the demons believe and tremble. Demons believe, but they don't serve God. Demons believe, but they don't love Him. Demons believe, but they don't support the message. They don't uh, preach the gospel. Demons believe they have a mental assent, but their lives are not conformed to the plan and purpose of God. 
So notice what Jesus said. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now, this is interesting because this is absolutely not a gospel by works. In other words, you have certain groups out in society who think that if they knock on enough doors, that they do these things, then somehow their good works secure a right standing with God. And that's not true at all. That is called working your way into salvation. Let me tell you something. You can't volunteer your way into salvation. You can't do anything like that. Jesus already paid it. But here's what James is saying, and I'm going to show you in just a moment that Jesus taught the same thing. The fact that you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, it literally means that a change has happened. Now you're not working for God to get salvation. You're working because of salvation, because your nature has changed. Your desire has changed. Jesus is now your Lord. He is your master. And where he tells you to go, and what he tells you to do, is what you do. Are you still with me this morning? I think the reason why much of our modern world, especially here in the West, has developed weak Christians who fall away when the preacher doesn't shake their hand. They fall away when something happens in the church, something a picture that they like is taken off the wall and they leave. But people, people get all types of upset in the Western world because we've painted a gospel, if you will, that really doesn't cost man much. And so today we're going to look into the depths of this and we're going to see what does it really mean to follow Christ? What does it really mean to be a disciple? See, here's the truth. In churches all across America, not every church, I'm using that as a very generic form. In a lot of churches across America, you can easily hear stuff like this thundered from the microphone each Sunday. If you come to Christ, then here's what you hear. You'll receive your best life here and now. I heard one preacher say, with Jesus, every day is a Friday. I heard somebody say, That if you come to Jesus, all of your problems will be better. I got news for somebody. When I came to Jesus, a lot of my problems got worse before they got better. Now, I want to bring some balance here. Because here's the thing. The message of the gospel is what we refer to as counterculture. In other words, Jesus did not come and go with the flow. Jesus came and went against the flow. Jesus went against the grain of everything that was going on in the world in which he was living. Listen, if Jesus had not done that, he would not have been crucified. He wouldn't have been crucified. He literally came in counterculture like sandpaper, totally abrasive, and totally wrecked the system that was on the earth at that time. Now, I want you to get this. People have said, come to Jesus and everything will be hunky-dory. I even heard an evangelist say this one time. I want you to hear this. This is so scary. Because I believe, listen, I believe in preaching about hell. I believe in preaching about sin. I believe in all of those things. They're all biblical. They need to be preached on within balance. Because listen, it's okay to get saved because of hell, but you won't keep living for Jesus because of hell. It is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Now understand, Jude says, with some say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, and others have compassion. You reach different people different ways. But here's what we have to understand. Looking at the totality of Scripture, what we see is, we see a loving God who, in the form of His Son, took on the sins of the world, died on the cross, so that you and I could have a restored relationship with God. And in that, What we see is that Jesus says, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. But I heard an evangelist say this one time, preaching these guilt messages, trying to make conversions and people boast about, I had this many people saved, this many people saved the prayer. Jesus never said go into all the world and make decisions. He said go into all the world and make disciples. There's a difference, my friend. 
You can have all the big converts and crusades you want to, but if you don't have the infrastructure of follow-up and people following behind them, plugging them into a local church and growing them as a believer, you've done nothing more than have a baby outside of an ER and leave it in a dumpster. The Christian life is to be nurtured, is to be grown, it is to be matured. Paul said, as a little child, I labor over you until Christ be formed in you. Paul was looking at people who he had brought along and brought into a place of following Christ. And he kept telling them, we're on this journey together. Salvation is a journey. But I heard a preacher one time, he he was given an altar call, you know, turn or burn. Jesus is going to come back in the next 30 seconds if you don't get to this altar. And he told somebody, he said, do it, do it now. Come, say the prayer while you still can. And he got them up to the front. He says, I want you to take a pen right now. And I want you to write your name in the back of the Bible and the date of today's date. And any time in your life, no matter where you are, what you've done, if the devil tries to come to you and says you're not saved, look at the back of this Bible and just read that. And there you can have your assurance. That's not biblical. Paul said, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. And I believe that we have taken a portion of conversion that is important, which is confession. Confessing that Jesus is Lord. And I, I think that we have forgotten to preach obedience. And this is where we get into balance here. Are you still with me? Because it only gets worse from here. Listen, one time the, the, the USPS brought me a notice from the IRS and I was so mad. But I couldn't be mad at the post office because they didn't come up with it. They just delivered it. I'm going to tell you, I'm just delivering today. So I want you to hear me. Jesus never preached such a following. He never preached such a following. In fact, Jesus was very clear, always clear with his disciples to the point that they knew that there was a cost associated with following him. When he came to Peter and the other disciples and they were by the banks fishing, Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And Peter had to immediately leave his lucrative fishing. He wasn't with the cane pole, folks. He wasn't with the cane pole with his feet kicked up beside the Jordan River fishing. He had a fishing business. He was wealthy. It was lucrative. It was a a way that he made his living. Not only did he have that, he had people that worked for him. And to follow Jesus, Peter had to make a choice. Do I keep on doing what I'm doing or do I transition my life to follow the one who's calling me? To Peter, it was letting go of his lucrative fishing business. To the rich young ruler, it was renouncing his wealth whom Jesus discerned had a great hold upon him. To others, it was different things. We see with Zacchaeus, whenever he climbed in a tree and he saw Jesus, before he would follow Jesus, he had to restore everything that he had stolen. There are others who traveled with Jesus who said, Lord, we will follow you everywhere you go. To which Jesus replied, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus was homeless. He had a home in Capernaum. Jesus was not homeless. What it meant was, as an itinerant minister, he was going to be in different places at different times, so you better not be used to the comfort of everyday life. Jesus knew his assignment for a short time was better than temporary comfort. There are others who wanted to go up when Jesus had called them, and they wanted to go and settle their family affairs. Jesus, my father died. I mean, please, God, I'm going to go back and handle the funeral stuff, and and I want to get all of that taken care of. And while that seems noble to us, and that seems like something we should be happy about, what did Jesus say? Jesus said very insensitively, might I add to our understanding, really it wasn't. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. To 11 of the 12 disciples, it would ultimately mean following Jesus would cost them their physical life. These are just a few instances, my friend, but we see that Christ was serious that people should be aware of the cost of following him and we should be willing to count the cost. You know, I personally believe that's why believers in other countries are more radical for Christ upon their conversion. Because let me tell you something. 
if you getting saved, if you knew, I'm convinced that there are not many people in this room or in this city, not all, that's a blanket statement, I'm convinced not many have paid such a great price to follow Christ as some of our overseas brothers and sisters. What would your salvation mean to you if you knew that you saying yes to Jesus meant that your whole family would die at the hands of a terrorist? See, we like the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. But what you don't know is it was a death march to somebody who was told to renounce Christ or your family is going to die. And what did that woman say? I have decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. There's a cost to associate, associated with following Christ. What would it mean like Christopher Alam, one of our missionaries that we support, a friend of ours, that wanted to be baptized and the Lutheran missionary knew that by baptizing this Muslim who had come to faith, it would possibly cost him his life, and it did. Pastor Seth, how would you feel about baptizing somebody if you knew that their Muslim parents would come kill you? How would you feel if giving your life to Christ meant that your husband or your wife would be taken away into slavery? But the truth of the matter is, this is what we wrestle with in the gospel in the book of Acts. This is why the church thrived and grew so much in this particular zone. Because uh, when a person would convert from Judaism to Christianity, many of their family members, they ostracized them. They kicked them out. Uh, Husbands and, and wives separated. Kids and parents separated because they had decided to follow Christ. To the point to where they had a big start over. It wasn't New Testament socialism. This pattern didn't continue forever. But in this particular instance, they took everything they had and got it all together, distributed it out so that everybody could start over on equal playing ground. The gospel came for the cost. And as we get to the place I want to get to this morning, are you still with me today? Turn back with me to Matthew chapter 16, our text. It almost seems like I'm going the wrong direction preaching after the cross when we preached on the cross last week. But I want to show you the moments that led up to the cross. From that time, verse number 21, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and to suffer many things. From the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised from the third day. But Peter, his beloved disciple, the zealous one, began to rebuke him saying, Lord, far be it from me. This shall not happen to you. And he turned and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Now that doesn't mean Peter was Satan or he was possessed with Satan, but Jesus perceived where that discouragement was coming from. He said, get behind me, Satan, for you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Peter was looking out for his own personal comfort. And Jesus used this opportunity in verse number 24 to say this. Therefore, Jesus said to his disciples, notice this. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will he give in exchange for his soul? Really quickly this morning, the first thing I want to show you, number one, is the invitation of discipleship. Jesus said, if anyone desires to follow me, Let him pick up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. That was Jesus' message to everybody that he called. You never see Jesus or Paul run up to somebody and say, you want to follow Jesus? Just repeat this real quick. Do we lead people in a sinner's prayer? Yes. Because it's about confessing and and admitting and believing that Jesus is Lord. What I'm trying to show you is we've sold an incomplete picture. That the life of a disciple is a life that has been laid down. One where we are following Christ. His ambition is our ambition. His goal is our goal. His call is our call. Notice this, the invitation of discipleship. Jesus gave a personal invitation to join his cause. 
What was, called, what was the cause? It was to further the kingdom of God. According to Webster's Dictionary, Webster Miriam, here's what it says. A disciple is one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines of another. In other words, according to Webster's Dictionary, a disciple is not merely just one who accepts. I believe, I believe, I believe. Remember, even the demons believe and tremble. Notice, Webster says of a disciple, one who accepts and assists in the spreading of the doctrines of another. In other words, don't tell me you're a disciple of Christ if you don't ever tell anybody about Jesus. If the people you work with on your job don't know that you're a Christian, they don't know that you love the Lord, they can't see it in the fruit of your actions. No, listen, a disciple is one by definition who spreads the message. Why? Because there's no high like the most high. That old gospel song, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Listen, when you come in contact to the one with his resurrected life who's changed you from the inside out, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things pass away. Behold, all things become new. How can you come in contact to that and not be changed? There's an invitation of discipleship. I want to ask you a question today. According to that definition, are you a disciple? Are you a disciple? See, not only do we have the invitation of a, the invitation of a disciple, number two, we have the model of discipleship. Notice now, Jesus was on the way to the cross. He was on the way to fulfill the assignment that the Father had given him from the foundation, the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Now I want you to notice this, that Peter is, is, is troubled about Jesus' assignment. And what does he say? He says, Lord, suffer it not to be so. I don't want you to go to the cross. And what did Jesus say? Peter, no, you're thinking with your carnal mind. You're not thinking about the plan of God. You're not thinking about redemption. He later told his disciples, I've got to do this. It's expedient. For me to go away. Because if I don't go. The comforter cannot come. That's Jesus words. There are a lot of people who say. Man if Jesus were here pastor. I would live different. If Jesus were here I would act different. If Jesus were here I would be more serious. Jesus said it was more important for him to go away. Because if he didn't go away. The Holy Spirit could not come. In other words Jesus. Paraphrasing his own words. A personal encounter with Jesus. It's the same as being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because now He lives on the inside of us. There's the invitation of discipleship. Then there's the model of discipleship. Jesus said, if any man seeks to follow me, let him deny himself. Everybody say, deny. I hate to tell you this. But sometimes following Jesus may mean denying you. Your goals, your dreams, your wish list. That's why some people are so wishy-washy in their supposed faith with God because they are a mouth disciple and not an action disciple. When I was saved, when I first got saved, my wife's on the front row in the, in the big yellow shirt. You will not miss her. She will tell you the truth. She will shake her head. When we first got married... I've not always been in the ministry. I used to win people to Christ on my job in the steel mill and in the aluminum factory. We'd have breaks, and at, uh, a Bible study on our breaks, and we'd talk about Jesus. And, and I'm telling you, I was full-time in ministry before I was full-time in ministry. And I'll tell you something about those times when I got laid off from that job, and I went and found another job, and, and I'm working. And listen, I'm not preaching legalism today. I'm telling you how I live my life. I was serving in my local church at that time. I had made a commitment to play drums on the worship team. I had made a commitment to drive the van. And that commitment meant something to me. You see, the Bible says that, uh, uh, it, it, you know, when you make a vow before God, you need to keep it. And he later said that if you can't do that, it's better to not vow than to vow. God is in heaven, you are on earth, so therefore let your words be few. Watch what you say. I made a commitment. 
So I couldn't find a job, and I ended up finding this job, and I said, okay, there's one thing you've got to understand. I need to be off on Sunday. I worship God on Sunday. I'm involved in my church on Sunday. And, and that worked for about three weeks until they said, well, he probably needs his job more than that. And, and so they, they started working me on Sundays where I'm missing church. Listen, let me tell you what I did. I walked out. So I can't believe you did that. I know me. And I have to keep my commitments to God. You know, some people would have said, oh, listen, oh, you got another job, a blessing. Any blessing you get from God doesn't take you away from Him. Oh, Lord, I just pray that I'd get a new boat. Oh, Jesus, I just need a boat. You know I need to relax. But if it's causing you to relax every Sunday and you can't come to church, that's not a blessing. That's a curse. So many times we put on God that, that it's a blessing. Oh, Lord, you've blessed me. No, 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 no. Listen, blessings take you closer to God, not farther away from him. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you've got to lay down your life. Now, listen to me. Jesus gives us health and healing to serve him. He heals our bodies when we're sick. We have a covenant relationship with Him. He even gives us prosperity and blessings. Not so that we can build our own kingdom, but so that we can build His kingdom. I was thinking about something the other day, and I'm getting ready to close. You know, I was thinking over doing my taxes the other day, and how many of you know that my grandfather used to say there are only two things certain in life, death and taxes. They even dealt with taxes in Jesus' day. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and render unto God's what is God's. And I got to thinking about it. I've got, I know you're supposed to throw those things away after seven years, your returns. I've got all of mine from age 18. And I looked at what we made the first year we were married, and I said, dear God, how did we ever live on that? How did we ever survive? And I began to look and track on how God has blessed me at 38 from 18, 20 years later. But not only has my income increased, but my giving has increased. Because listen, God don't want you to have up living and skateboard giving. God blesses you with material things on this earth. Yes, so that we can enjoy our life. Yes, God wants you. The Sabbath day was his idea. God wants us to enjoy. But everything that comes through my pocket, my hands, it doesn't belong to me. I am just a manager. It belongs to God. My truck, my house, everything that I have belongs to him. And if I allow it to take me farther away from him, then you have to crucify it. The model of discipleship was, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. One of Jesus' greatest cries in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the flesh of Jesus wrestled with the divinity of Jesus, being fully God and fully man, he said, Lord, if there be any other way, let it pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will. You know, there are times where God's going to ask us to do stuff as a Christian. We're not going to want to do it. But how did Jesus wrestle? Lord, not your will, but mine. See, we got to kick over this sacred cow that goes, what? Just say it real fast and you're good. No, no, no. Jesus never said that. Here's how Jesus presented salvation. Follow me. Follow me. Grab my hand and follow me. Not about sinless, per 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 sinless perfection. People, say, people think that, oh, you know, you never sin if you're a Christian. You never mess up. No, it's not about that at all. There's blood. There's grace. There's mercy. It's about follow me. Follow me. Jesus grabbed all the disciples and said, follow me. Paul even said this, follow me as I follow Christ. Number three, we want to look at the reward of discipleship. Going back to Matthew chapter 16, notice what Jesus said. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever seeks to lose his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world 
and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus tells us the reward of discipleship. You listening? It's losing your life to get his. It's losing your life for his. Jesus gives you peace in the middle of a storm. He can give you healing in the middle of sickness and disease. He can give you guidance in the middle of confusion. But listen to me, friend. He never promised that your life would be without trouble. Job, though it be an Old Testament book, here's what Job said. A man that is born of a woman is but of a few days and full of trouble. Man, we're going to go through things. We're going to do things. But listen. Jesus doesn't just make our life better. He gives us a new life. That's why people, I get so tickled at them during New Year's. New Year's Eve, they write all their resolutions out and they say, man, I want to start a New Year's resolution. I want to turn over a new leaf. Honey, you don't need a new leaf. You need a whole new tree. It's the tree called Calvary. And listen, Jesus took a fisherman named Peter and turned him into the greatest gospel preacher, reaching 3,000 people plus women and children and everything else within a moment's time. Jesus said, you know what, Peter, if you follow me, I'll, you, you're fishing for bass and, and things like that, but if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men, Peter. Your purpose is not in what you can do for yourself. Your purpose is found in what you can do for me. And now Peter became a soul winner because of God's call upon his life. Here's the sacred cow we're killing this morning. Everybody stand. That the gospel is not about an easy believism. Just repeat it real quick. And you're good. Listen, I lead people in those prayers. But I always tell them, this is about following Jesus. Follow Him. 1 John says, if we walk in the light. Somebody say walk. If we walk in the light. He didn't say if you stop in the light. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us continually from sin. Man, salvation is not about works. It's not about what we can do good or how much we mess up or don't mess up. It's about following Jesus. And here's what I want to ask you today. Are you a follower of Jesus? If you are, then I want to ask you this question. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. I'm going to ask you this question. If you're following Him, does He really have all of your life? Or are there things that are hidden to Him that you say, Jesus, you can't have this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, listen, even your children can be an idol to God. When you won't release them to let God do what He wants to do in their life. Your job can be an idol, although God wants you to have a job. Your truck can be an idol, even though God wants you to be able to get around. But a discipled life means, Lord, wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Whatever you want me to say, I'll say. Whatever you need from me, Lord, it doesn't belong to me anyway. My voice belongs to you. My money belongs to you. Everything belongs to you. And Lord, if you want me to give it right now, it's yours. That's what it means to follow him.